Okay, so can you see this now? Yep, all good, thank 25 you. 25 week uh, preterm baby. And the question here is uh, how we go about uh, best nourishing this baby. Well, uh, this is a 25 week gestation preterm and this baby should still be in the uterus. And when this baby is in the uterus, uh, uh, he or she is getting a continuous supply of glucose. Uh, protein is taken up at around four grams per kilogram per day. That fetus is getting lipids at three grams per kilogram per day and also receiving 150 milliliters per kilogram per day of amniotic fluid through the gastrointestinal tract. So the gastrointestinal tract is not just resting in this uh, fetus. The gastrointestinal tract is actually being used. Now, in terms of uh, prenatal enteral nutrition, this, uh, uh, we do have swallowing in the fetus, like I just mentioned, and this develops at around 18 to 20 weeks gestational age. And there is some evidence that uh, uh, amniotic fluid does contribute to nutrition of the fetus because it contains about four grams per liter of protein. This is uh, uh, somewhat less than what you find in human milk. It's, uh, human milk is around 10 grams per liter, but it does contribute to some of the uh, nutrition of the uh, fetus. In rabbit models, it's, it's estimated that 10 to 14% of fetal nutrition comes from the amniotic fluid. Now, when a baby is born preterm, the, uh, this preterm baby has a, a decreased amount of gastric acid production, has increased permeability of the uh, 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 gastrointestinal epithelium, has reduced immunoglobulins and immature mucin barrier. So this is a very um, vulnerable intestine, very fragile intestine that is prone to insults for uh, various reasons, including these. And uh, if you'd like to uh, uh, perhaps read uh, more about uh, this, uh, this, this whole issue, we recently published a paper a review article uh, that I refer you to, and it's titled Gastrointestinal and Feeding Issues for Infants Less Than 25 Weeks of Gestation. But I'll be talking about uh, some of this as we go through this lecture. So in the past, uh, it's been very uh, common that uh, we use all kinds of excuses to withhold enteral feedings in these uh, uh, very fragile preterm babies. Why? because we're concerned that these babies are not going to be able to tolerate these feedings or that these babies might get what we see on this slide here, a very distended abdomen. And this is uh, what we commonly refer to as necrotizing enterocolitis. And there are all kinds of dogmas uh, around enteral feeding of preterms. And these dogmas state that umbilical catheters should not be, uh, if, if we're using umbilical catheters, we should not be feeding babies. If we've had low APGAR scores, we should not be feeding these babies. If there's apnea, bradycardia, mechanical ventilation, CPAP, they're on vasoactive drugs. If they're on endomethacin, we should not be feeding these babies. These are all dogmas in neonatology, but none of these are evidence-based. And I think that's very important to remember. These have uh, uh, just seemed to make sense to people, but the evidence behind these practices is really not there. So where do we go with this? Well, here is on the bottom of this, pic, uh, this slide, Richard Ehrenkrantz. He is a neonatologist at Yale University. And uh, the late 1990s, uh, he looked at the uh, uh, weight gain uh, of a reference fetus that's in utero, and he looked at the 50th percentile of weight gain and the 10th percentile of weight gain, and then he looked at babies who were born and taken care of in the neonatal intensive care unit. Here's 24, 25 week, 26, 27, 26, uh, 28 to 29 weeks gestation, and we can see that uh, the average uh, weight of these babies' legs behind, well behind, that of a reference fetus. So we are actually causing extra uterine growth restriction in these babies. They are not growing anywhere near the same way that they would be growing in the uterus. And this is a potential cause for alarm. Why? Well, 
here's another slide that I think uh, should be uh, uh, very uh, important to our understanding of the body composition of these extremely low birth weight babies. So here we have 24 week, 26, 26, uh, 28, 40 week gestation babies. And here we see some of their body composition. This 24 week gestation preterm has 1% body fat, 0.1% body fat. That provides about 19.5 calories. The 26 weeker has a little bit more, 1.5% body fat, which can provide 123 calories. But that energy store is really not enough. It would take a very short period of time to utilize all that energy. And this uh, preterm baby, once this energy is utilized, uh, the fat energy is utilized, this baby will begin to undergo catabolism, breaking down the rest of the lean body mass to produce glucose. So this is highly problematic. We know from numerous studies that if a baby is being fed enterally, exclusively by the intestinal route, usually that baby can grow at 100, if that baby is getting 120 calories per kilogram per day. If that baby is on TPN, that means no enteral feeding, one can attain positive nitrogen balance with 60 calories per kilo per day with about 2.5 grams per kilo per day of protein. But if you want that baby to grow on TPN, you have to give that baby approximately 80 calories per kilogram per day. Now, in most of these very low birth weight micro preemies, we cannot get to full enteral feeding quickly. And we have to use intravenous nutrition as a bridge to full enteral feeding. But we can get to enteral feeding much faster than we thought we could in the past. In the past, it was very common to sometimes keep babies MPO for one, two weeks, and even longer. This is no longer uh, our practice, and this is uh, a practice that we are now uh, undergoing based on evidence, which I'll show you. Now, in terms of the energy requirements of this 25-week preterm baby, I said before, that baby requires about 120 calories per kilo per day. What does that equate to in terms of an adult? Well, here's an adult who is doing the Tour de France, riding his bicycle all day long. With riding that bicycle all day long, that guy needs 7,000 calories per day. And assuming he's 60 kilograms, he is getting 120 calories per kilo per day. But that is as a Tour de France bicycle rider. So this is telling us that this baby is requiring a tremendous amount of energy. This is not just for metabolic processes, but also for growth. The amount of protein on a per kilogram basis is also huge that this baby requires. Preterm infants require four to five times as much protein per kilogram compared to an adult. So this is telling us that this is required not just for metabolic processes, but also for growth. If you think of how fast a fetus is growing in utero and how fast a preterm baby should be growing in terms of the growth curves, preterm baby should be doubling or tripling its body weight within the first two to three months after birth. And that is one of the reasons why this baby on a per kilogram basis requires so much energy and so much protein. If the babies do not get this, then this could be problematic. These are graphs showing the uh, uh, MDI, Mental Development Index, Physical Development Index, less than 70, cerebral palsy rate, and also neurodevelopmental impairment at different feeding levels in uh, preterm babies. So here we see very low feeding level. Here's a high feeding level. And we see that the mental development index is much better 
for those babies who are getting a higher amount of feeding per day, 21.2 versus 12.0. And neurodevelopmental impairment down here is considerably less in those babies who are being fed higher quantities on a per kilogram basis. Now, I just want to talk a little bit about parenteral nutrition before I get into enteral. And we sometimes are very slow with initiating certain types of parenteral nutrition. For example, it's dogma that we should be providing slow increment, slow incremental increases of lipid to our micropremies. So for example, many neonatal intensive care units you start with 0.5 on the first day, one, and then 1.5 on the third day, then two. They go up very slowly. There is no rationale for that. And numerous studies have shown that we can provide between two to three grams per kilo per day safely to these babies of intravenous lipid if we provide that over a prolonged period of time, over 20 hours in a con slow continuous infusion. We know that essential fatty acid status in early infancy is low. And this is rapidly exacerbated with lipid-free nutrition. And I'll show you a slide on that shortly. And we also know that long chain polyunsaturated fatty acid derivatives from essential fatty acids are important in brain and retinal development. And so these need to be supplied. And we also need to provide energy in the form of lipid to prevent catabolism and to spare protein. So let's just talk a little bit about the essential fatty acids. And what do we mean by essential fatty acids? These are the fatty acids that uh, cannot be produced by the body. They have to be taken in via dietary sources. And these are linoleic and linolenic acid. And you can see there's an omega-2 fatty acid and omega, I'm sorry, an omega-6 fatty acid and omega-3 fatty acid. So the linoleic is an omega-6, linolenic is an omega-3 fatty acid. What does this mean? Well, very simply, we have 18 carbons in both of these uh, uh, long chain fatty acids, these essential fatty acids. We have uh, a certain number of double bonds, and this is the nomenclature used for our uh, the way that we name these uh, uh, fatty acids. And here is the position of the first double bond from the non-carboxyl, the omega, or the N-terminus. This happens to be oleic acid, which is a monounsaturated fatty acid. By monounsaturated, we mean that there is only one double bond. The omega-6 and the omega-3s have uh, their uh, first double bond at the three position or the six position from the uh, methyl terminus. And that's why they are called omega-3 and omega-6. And these are precursors for very important long chain fatty acids such as DHA, glucosa, hexaenoic acid, or arachidonic acid. And so the uh, uh, linoleic and linolenic acid get elongated and desaturated to, pro uh, to produce these uh, longer chain fatty acids. In the preterm baby, these desaturation elongation mechanisms are lacking and many babies cannot really perform these because of enzy enzymatic immaturities. So we also, in many of these babies, have to give the cosahexaenoic and arachidonic acid. Now, getting back to uh, the amount of lipid that these babies require for growth, before I mentioned that we need 80 calories per kilogram per day if these babies are being only fed by the parenteral route. And here, if we assume that the baby is getting glucose at eight milligrams per kilo per minute, that provides 39 calories. Amino acids at three grams per kilo per day, that provides 12. And if you do the calculation, you still need approximately or close to three grams, oops, three grams per kilo or three grams per kilo per day of uh, uh, lipid. Uh, to provide the uh, uh, full 80 calories per kilogram per day. 
So that has to be supplied if we want to provide for growth in these babies by the parenteral route. Now, here's just a couple important uh, summarizing messages in terms of lipid. The in utero lipid supply is approximately 2.5 to 3 grams per kilo per day. And that's what we should be providing to these babies right after birth. There is no reason why we cannot be doing this right after birth. Essential fatty acid status in early infancy is low and is rapidly exacerbated with lipid-free nutrition. The long-chain polyunsaturated fatty acid derivatives from the essential fatty acids are important in brain and retinal development. And we also have to give these lipids for the prevention of catabolism and protein sparing. So in terms of lipid, what day do you start? How much do you start with? You should be starting at around three grams per kilo per day and providing that uh, uh, over approximately 24 hours a day in terms of uh, uh, the lipid support. What about amino acids and proteins? Well, this is a, a picture of a good friend, Patty Thoreen, who uh, she actually passed away quite a few years ago, had uh, uh, early onset uh, uh, Alzheimer's disease, but uh, uh, she had some fantastic contributions to the field of neonatal nutrition. And this just happens to be one of them, where she did some studies looking at uh, uh, protein balance when babies were getting one gram per kilo per day of amino acid, shown here, versus three grams per kilo per day of amino acid. And these were the, uh, uh, the nitrogen balance measured by two different techniques using nitrogen balance method with isotopes and the other just uh, looking at uh, the amount of uh, nitrogen that came out of the urine and the stools compared to the amount of nitrogen that went in. And you can see that the nitrogen balance with three grams per kilo per day is much better than with only one gram per kilo per day. In fact, you hardly get positive nitrogen balance with one gram per kilo per day. So we need to provide at least three grams per kilo per day. Is this safe? Well, she found that the BUN levels really do not differ if you give three grams per kilo per day versus one gram per kilo per day. And another interesting finding was that uh, uh, the high amino acid intake with three grams per kilo per day versus the low amino acid uh, intake resulted in the same uh, amount of blood glucose but the insulin level with the high amino acid intake was considerably higher, almost twice that of the low amino acid intake, suggesting that you had a stimulation of the insulin secretion by, the, uh, 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 by these amino acids. So how does that work? If we have delayed TPN, hyper, uh, you can get hyperglycemia and hyperkalemia. So the way this works is if you delay TPN, you have low leucine, arginine, and other amino acids. These are known to stimulate insulin, and if they're low, then the insulin level stays low. With a low insulin, you have high glucose, and with high glucose, potassium goes out of the cells. So you end up having hyperkalemia and hyperglycemia in many of these babies who are not getting early amino acid intake. Here we have the same baby, uh, but now 27 weeks gestation and had, baby had APGARs of three and uh, five, has UA and UV catheters in place, is on mechanical ventilation, and is getting prophylactic in a methicin to try to prevent intracranial hemorrhage. So the questions, we have here, can we feed this baby using the GI tract? What are the consequences of not feeding this baby? And how do we enterally feed this baby? Well, over 60 years ago, uh, Professor Elsie Whit Whittleson in the UK did some studies on the suckled pig. And she found that the suckled pig's duodenum gains 42% of its weight in the first 24 hours after birth. This is what is called the trophic effect of food in the gastrointestinal tract. If you don't put food into the gastrointestinal tract and just provide uh, uh, nutrients intravenously, you have 
very minimal, if any, uh, trophic effect on gut growth. So this is problematic. Even though you may be nourishing the baby if you're giving TPN, you are not providing a trophic effect on the gastrointestinal tract. There were other studies done in the UK, and this is a study done in the late 1980s by Dr. Alan Lucas and colleagues, colleagues looking at uh, several gut hormones, enteroglucagon, gastrin, GIP, motilin, and neurotensin. And at birth, they saw these levels. At six days, they saw these levels, and these were babies who were not being enterally fed. So that meant that from the time of birth to six days, you saw no difference in these hormonal levels. But if they were fed, and even if they had respiratory distress syndrome, you saw a marked increase in these uh, uh, gastrointestinal hormones. So these are very important hormones, several of which uh, cause uh, uh, gut growth and also improve motility of the gastrointestinal tract. So if you don't put food into the gastrointestinal tract, you don't have the secretion of these very important hormones. Gastrointestinal motility also increases over the gestational period. And here what we see uh, the uh, uh, an immature uh, motility pattern in babies. The green represents uh, immature motility pattern in babies at 24, 27 weeks gestation. 2831, still quite a bit of uh, uh, immature motility pattern. 32 to 35, it begins to improve. 36 to 42, very little of this immature motility pattern. And from the previous slide, we showed that in, uh, introducing enteral feedings is something that uh, actually will improve this motility pattern. What happens to the liver? if you do not provide enteral nutrition. Well, here's a, a, a picture of uh, piglets who were being fed by the enteral route versus the parenteral route over here. And you can see oh, after seven days of being on total parenteral nutrition, no feeding, that's uh, on the right, we see a liver that looks very different than the liver on the left. We see an H&E uh, section, ballooning of the hepatocytes. We see fat staining and glycogen staining in the liver of the uh, 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 piglet that was only given TPN. So only seven days of TPN can actually cause these changes in the liver of these animals. Over the past several decades, we've begun to recognize more and more that we can provide at least small amounts of feeding to uh, preterm babies. And this happens to be a, a, a paper that we wrote in 1992 that uh, was titled Gastrointestinal Priming Prior to Full Enteral Nutrition in Very Low Birth Weight Infants. And at that time, at least in the United States, it was very common not to give uh, uh, not to give any enteral feedings to babies, uh, to uh, these preterm babies for a week and sometimes two weeks after birth. And we introduced this uh, technique called gastrointestinal priming, where we gave small quantities, less than 20 milliliters per kilogram per day in the first week after birth to these babies, just to provide some food to the gastrointestinal tract. Even that was a, a very difficult concept for neonatologists to, uh, to grasp onto in the 1990s, but we've changed considerably since that time. Here's another study that was done at Baylor University looking at what happens to the permeability of the gastrointestinal tract if you don't put food into the gastrointestinal tract of preterm babies. So here's the mean birth weight of the, the babies in this study, one kilogram, and their gestational age was about 28 weeks, and there were two groups. One group was receiving GI priming, that's small amounts of feeding, around 20 milliliters per kilogram per day from day four to 14. And the other group was receiving TPN, no enteral feeding. What happened to the permeability of the gastrointestinal tract in these two groups? Well, the blue here represents the TPN only. And you can see that the permeability 
as measured by the lactulose to mannitol ratio is considerably higher in those babies who are getting TPN only. This means that uh, you have a greater leakiness of the gut in those babies who are not having any food placed into their gastrointestinal tract. There's also an another interesting finding that was uh, uh, looked at in animals, and this is a study done at University of Michigan uh, a little bit over a dec around a decade ago, and this was done in mice. And what they did was they uh, gave mice TPN and did not give them any enteral feeding versus uh, feeding them. And you see that the microbial ecology of the gastrointestinal tract differs markedly in those animals, those baby animals who were fed versus not fed. This blue in the unfed animals represents a phylum of bacteria called the proteobacteria. And there have been numerous studies showing that the proteobacteria, which have high levels of LPS in their cell wall, are associated with greater inflammatory conditions in uh, uh, animals and also humans. This is a study that looked at human preterm babies and also looked at the microbial ecology of the gastrointestinal tract in babies who were given TPN versus babies who were being enterally fed. And again, the microbial ecology differed markedly in these two groups. And there were more of the uh, proteobacteria in the uh, uh, babies who were uh, on TPN versus those babies who were the control babies who were being enterally fed. Another study, which was a retrospective observational study that was done by Kenny Martin's group at Harvard, looked at babies who were fed early, that's is prior to four days versus late after four days. And they looked at some of the adverse outcomes, which included necrotizing enterocolitis, retinopathy, a prematurity, chronic lung disease, et cetera, all of these comorbidities. And they found that the late enteral feeding group had a much greater association with all of these comorbidities. And this is a univariate analysis. They saw the same thing with a multivariate analysis. But again, this was retrospective, observational, not prospective, randomized. But another interesting finding was that at two weeks, those babies who were fed late had higher levels of pro-inflammatory mediators in their bloodstream, such as IL-8. And th this is associated with uh, the development of inflammatory uh, damage, such as lung damage and also central nervous system damage. So late feeding can be associated with uh, a greater inflammatory response. A multi-center study from the UK looked at uh, two incremental milk feeding rates in preterm babies to see if uh, uh, giving 18 milliliters per kilo per day versus 30 milliliters per kilo per day increments on a daily basis would be safe and would result in differences in uh, uh, neurodevelopmental outcome. They followed these babies uh, until they were uh, over two years of age and they found no differences in neurodevelopmental outcome. But of interest was that the uh, uh, two different incremental feeding rates did not result in greater incidence of necrotizing enterocolitis or other adverse outcomes within the neonatal intensive care unit. So some of the questions that we have, uh, some of the dogmas that we still have are, do we keep feeding babies if they're on endomethacin for a ductus or if they're getting endomethacin for IV prophylaxis, if they're getting blood transfusions, if they're on uh, uh, getting hypothermia, for uh, uh, hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. Well, let's look at this first. This is a study that was done at Baylor University in piglets looking at superior mesenteric artery blood flow. And while these piglets were being enterally fed, here's the level of superior mesenteric artery blood flow. When they were switched to TPN, the superior mesenteric artery blood flow actually decreased. Now, why do we have a rationale or what is the rationale for not feeding babies while they are on endomethacin? 
or some of these other vasoactive agents. Well, it's thought that perhaps uh, when we feed these babies, uh, what's going to happen is that you're going to decrease the blood flow even more. Well, this slide, at least in this study of piglets, shows that uh, you may be actually exacerbating the situation if you give in the methicin and you stop feeding the babies because that will actually even decrease the blood flow more, at least on a theoretical basis. Here's a study that was done by Ron Kleiman and colleagues looking at uh, enteral feeding during indomethacin and ibuprofen treatment for a uh, patent vectus arteriosus. And if you just look at the conclusion at the bottom, infants required less time to reach the feeding volume and endpoint if they were given trophic enteral feedings when they received indomethacin or ibuprofen treatments. So this suggested that it was safe and also efficacious to uh, uh, provide feeding to babies who are on indomethacin. What about uh, uh, babies who are uh, receiving hypothermia for hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy? There are many guidelines that say that we should not be feeding these babies. And the, uh, the usual rationale that I hear is that uh, uh, these babies' uh, gastrointestinal tracts are just not functioning. And if we put any food into their gastrointestinal tract, they are going to develop necrotizing enterocolitis. That was never shown. In fact, uh, very early studies done over a decade ago where uh, they compared the Swedish technique versus the UK technique, where in the Swedish technique, they fed babies, and in the UK technique, they did not feed babies, uh, they found no difference in terms of adverse outcomes. So at the University of Florida, we did a, uh, a, a small study where we looked at enteral feeding as an adjunct to hypothermia in neonates with hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. And here's what we found. We found that minimal enteral nutrition in the babies who received it had a reduced length of hospital stay. The babies who received the enteral nutrition that was they were associated with less days receiving parenteral nutrition and time to full oral feedings was less. Minimal enteral nutrition was associated with a significant reduction in uh, certain pro-inflammatory cytokines. And the brain MRIs were not significantly different between the two groups. And certainly we saw no differences in terms of uh, necrotizing enterocolitis, but this was actually a very small cohort. Now, here's a question about this baby. Uh, this is a, uh, a baby who is uh, being fed two milliliters of breast milk, and it's two o'clock in the morning, and the nurse calls you and says that this baby has two cc's of gastric residuals. What do you do? So here's the quiz. So probably you'd want to do the third one, ask about the physical exam and examine the baby yourself. But a more important question is, why do we do gastric residuals in the first place? Gastric residual evaluations uh, have, there was something that, that these were, uh, this was a practice started in neonatology that was really not evidence-based. And so uh, a few years ago, we uh, did a prospective randomized trial of uh, uh, get doing gastric residuals versus not doing gastric residuals. And this was published in JAMA Pediatrics just a couple of years ago. And the title of this article was Effect of Gastric Residual Evaluation on Enteral Intake in Extremely Preterm Infants. And what we saw here was that uh, uh, evaluating gastric residuals uh, is totally unnecessary. And the practice of doing gastric residuals actually decreases the delivery of enteral nutrition to extremely preterm infants. And we also found that uh, uh, not doing these was totally safe, that we did not see any difference in uh, adverse outcomes uh, by, uh, by not doing gastric residual evaluations routinely. Now, uh, in 2012, the American Academy of Pediatrics recommended what we should be feeding to our preterm babies. And of course, human milk is what we should be feeding to these babies. And if baby's own mother's milk is not available, we should be providing donor milk. 
But there are some problems with uh, uh, both babies' own mother's milk and donor milk. Donor milk is pasteurized, and a lot of the uh, uh, good bioactive ingredients in babies' own mother's milk, the fresh babies' own mother's milk, are lost. We lose the lipase. We, use, we lose the alkaline phosphatase. We, use, we lose several of the immunoglobulins and also live microbes that may be bioactive in the gastrointestinal tract. We also know that the uh, protein requirement of the fetus is quite high and that the protein requirement of the extra uterine fetus or our extremely low birth weight baby is also high. And if we were just giving donor milk to these babies, they would be receiving about 0.8 to 0.9 grams per kilo per day of protein. So we would need to be giving around 330 milliliters uh, per kilo per day of term donor human milk to meet this requirement. And many of our babies just cannot tolerate this large quantity. So one of the things we need to do is fortify this. And uh, we fortify this with uh, with protein. Different, there are many forms of protein available that we can fortify the donor milk with, and also the baby's own mother's milk. Here's an interesting picture. What do you think is going on here? Well, this is the baby's arm, and that's the humerus, and the humerus has a displaced fracture. This occurs all too often in neonatal intensive care. And many of our preterm babies are getting low calcium. They're not getting very much vitamin D. They're getting diuretics and they're also getting steroids and all of these predisposed to bone fractures in these babies. And we do know from several studies, including this study by Eckhard Ziegler, that uh, uh, we need to fortify calcium and phosphorus uh, in uh, human milk. So, uh, Here's the uh, uh, human milk, calcium, and phosphorus levels. Here is what is actually required. So we need to uh, uh, do something to fortify the uh, calcium and phosphorus to help prevent this kind of a catastrophe. Now, growth curves are commonly used in neonatal intensive care. And here again is uh, the growth curve that I showed you before. And we see the lagging behind in the ideal is to have this happen during the baby's uh, uh, stay in the neonatal intensive care unit. That is very, very difficult. And unfortunately, uh, if we do see falling off of the growth curve, this already means that we are behind the curve and there are many uh, long-term effects that may have already occurred after falling off the growth curve. And we are now entering a new era of neonatology, and this is uh, the era of uh, uh, artificial intelligence and uh, nutritional multiomics and precision nutrition. And we are just beginning to do some studies that uh, uh, look at uh, uh, various features of preterm babies. So, for example, if they were born uh, IUGR, if it's a boy versus a girl, if the uh, mother was exposed to antibiotics during pregnancy, if there was preeclampsia, putting all those features together along with some laboratory features, the microbiome, uh, looking at inflammatory mediators, looking at uh, uh, some of the metabolites in these babies, and putting them together into a systems network analysis and using artificial intelligence we should be able to, in the future, be able to uh, 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 develop biomarkers that uh, tell us well ahead of time which babies should be getting certain kinds of nutrients that we can personalize for these particular babies. So that's the future. This is going to take some time, but I think the technology is there and or still being, uh, being developed, but it will be there. So I'd like to stop here with some take-home messages. Early nutrition in preterm uh, babies can be safe and efficacious and may prevent significant morbidity. We should be able to use the gastrointestinal tract. Many of the dogmas that have uh, uh, prevented rapid incorporation of early nutrition have either been disproved, not based on fact, or weak. 
And enteral nutrition has many benefits for the extremely low birth weight infant. We should use the GI tract wisely whenever possible. And not all preterm infants are the same, and the future will need to focus on a more personalized approach that accounts for specific gestational age and degree of illness, and also omic considerations. And I'd like to stop there and thank you for your attention. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Well, wow, thank you, Joe. Um, amazing talk, challenging uh, almost all our uh, current practice, I think. Um, while people are uh, waiting to either type their questions on the chat pane or to unmask themselves to ask you in person, uh, I know Rahul's got a burning question. So um, Rahul, first tips to you. Hi, I had a question. So in addition to the calcium and phosphate that we supplement in our uh, human milk fortifiers, do we need to give more calcium and phosphate as an additional um, daily requirement? Um, in that I, I, think, I think that if we are uh, providing uh, as close as we can to what the uh, uh, daily requirement is, uh, we should be okay. Okay. And the, I, I think the other thing we need to avoid is uh, the... If, if possible, uh, the uh, such common use of steroids uh, and uh, uh, diuretics. I, I think that uh, these are two drugs that are used, uh, probably overused in the uh, neonatal intensive care unit, and also uh, contribute to some of these uh, these bone problems that we see in our preterm babies. Thank you. Um, Joe, can I ask, how long did it take you to uh, convince uh, the nurses not to do gastric residuals? <laughs> uh, so this was, I think we had a very special uh, opportunity here because one of the, uh, uh, the people that I was working with, uh, Leslie Parker, was a professor in the College of Nursing. And she had a close relationship with our uh, nurse manager in the neonatal intensive care unit, and also had a very close relationship with the nurse practitioners and also the uh, the nurses in the neonatal ICU. And we would talk to them uh, and let them, you know, just give them in services. And they 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 were very supportive of this study when uh, when we started it. Uh, initially, they it was you know there was some resistance because this is the way that we have always done it. But I think they began to understand how important that uh, this really was, and that the uh, that the information that we had was uh, was really very lacking. Okay. And we also were able to get a uh, National Institutes of Health grant to do that prospective randomized study, which was uh, was very helpful. Right. Hey, maybe you can stop sharing. We can see more of you. Okay. <laughs> okay. Now the questions are. Paul Pouring in. So we'll start from uh, ooh, at Hunan. Ilana says uh, she would like more instructional experience in iron and vitamin D supplementation. Or maybe in that five seconds, you could do that. <laughs> <laughs> Another talk, Ilana, maybe? Yeah. Yeah. A very yeah. Well, important question. Sure, sure. Yeah, I, I think that usually by uh, two to three weeks after birth, we should be trying to supplement iron and uh, the amount of iron we should be giving is around two to four milligrams per kilo per day. Uh, that, that is the usual recommendation unless the baby is on erythropoietin which is then uh, increases the dose to six milligrams per kilo per day. Now uh, the other thing that uh, we have been doing is if the babies get transfusions and uh, we, uh, we look very closely at the serum ferritin. If the serum ferritin is high, we do not give up iron. Okay, thank you. Okay, Rohit asks, how do you assess feed intolerance when we, are, when we shouldn't be doing gastric aspiration? Abdominal girth measurement is not reliable. Uh, I guess the uh, question is what, other measures can you use? Well, I think that uh, the uh, uh, 
the gastric residual measurements are just as unreliable, if not more unreliable than uh, the uh, uh, abdominal distension. Uh, gastric residuals uh, uh, are all over the place. And uh, uh, also if you uh, do the gastric residuals and if you see that they're just a little bit off color, the nurses will sometimes say, oh, this looks yucky and they throw it away. And the baby has been working really hard to try to uh, 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 put out acid and uh, uh, some of the uh, stomach en enzymes to try to digest that. And you're just throwing it away when you do the gastric residual evaluations. And when you when the nurses draw back on the uh, 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 on the uh, catheters, uh, you know those little holes that you, you may be doing a little biop each time that uh, uh, you that the nurse draws back to try to do the gastric residual evaluation. So I think that uh, they from the from a, a teleologic viewpoint as well as the, the uh, randomized control prospective study evidence, uh, the use of gastric residuals is not worth the uh, the effort that we put into it. Okay. Okay. I might I might go on a different tech now and ask Justine Parsons from Newcastle. She's a nurse. She's one of our nurse educators in the neonatal unit in uh, John Hunter. Justine, can you ask unmask yourself because you've put a comment there saying that it's more trouble convincing the doctors, whereas in our nursery, it's the nurses. I think so. If any nurses online from the Royal as well, you could put in your comment. Justine. Oh, she's too shy. Um, Hello. Yeah. No, no, How here are I am. you? <laughs> Good, thank you. Um, <laughs> yep, we didn't have any trouble when we um, explained to the staff that we, it was possibly more harmful um, doing gastric residuals. And so we talked about the harm that was that was being introduced potentially and that all of those goodies should remain in the gut and not up and down the tube um, all the time. Also then the, the discussion about, about bacteria and things that are colonized in the tube and 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 what we're doing by stirring all of that up and reintroducing it to the gut up and down um, the gastric tube. So yes, that hasn't been difficult. Um, but we've just launched a new enteral feeding guideline here and um, are having some difficulties. So I noticed Kurt has said the same thing about how long does it take to successfully introduce an early feeding guideline because um, we have received a lot of pushback and yet um, I'm pleased to have watched your talk, uh, Dr New, and um, note that our guideline fits in very nicely with what you have um, presented today. So that's great. Great. And by the way, uh, we just recently published a, a, a paper on the uh, uh, microbiome of babies who were on the uh, uh, who were randomized to the two different arms of the gastric residual uh, evaluation and there were no differences in the fecal microbiome of those babies who had the uh, gastric residuals me measured versus those who did not so just uh, uh, I, if there's any concern about uh, you know one doing more co more colonizing than the other. There, at least from the perspective of, of the fecal microbiome, we saw no differences. Thank you. So while we're in Newcastle, I might bring Kurt online. Kurt is one of the neonatologists there, and sounds like he might have had problems introducing an early feeding guideline. Kurt, what's your problem? Hi, hi Julie. Um, hello, Professor Liu. It was indeed a very interesting talk. Um, repeating, but also adding towards your earlier talks about how, how good it is to do early feeding. And we should just, I don't know, we should, we should move with this movement. I think that's really important. No, I don't think I have much to add to what Justine was bringing. Um, we, we got a lot of feedback and we are just uh, reaching out and seeking, like, oh, how can we get our colleagues um, accepting and, and, and get online. I already send them like, now look at this talk, because um, Professor Nerd did a talk, I think a couple of months 
back from the Indian Society, and said, "Now look at this talk. It's really important." And here are the experts talking about uh, this topic. But yeah, um, now Justine summarized it all. Thanks. So you're you're not in, um, you're not regularly starting early feeds yet. Well, well, I am, <laughs> but you know that gives confusions on the floor. Okay. And, yeah, and I think yeah. that is also what you don't want. You, you don't want confusion on the floor with your nursing staff. You want them to do a, um, you know, just a guideline which works for them. yes. That's right. Okay, thank you, guys. Um, so quick question here from Dr. Angkor. Do you feed with a UAC and a UBC? That's a massive, um, you know, conundrum for many of us. Absolutely. Uh, that is absolutely, there's no contraindication to uh, putting food in the gut with a UAC or UVC. Uh, no information, no data that uh, uh, suggests that this is going to increase gut injury if you have a UAC or UVC in it, if you feed the baby. Okay. All right. We were very cautious still, I think, most of us. Yeah. Okay, and Dr. Hari Ram, your friend from Bangalore, has yes. uh, a very... Hi, <laughs> Hello, Dr. Hari Ram. Would you like to unmask yourself? Dr. Hari Ram, is he still there? Well, he's asked about glycerin enemas. I think we had a talk a couple of weeks ago from the Japanese, and they showed us like real-life action videos of uh, nurses doing glycerin enemas on the babies, and everyone was like, oh, my God. Uh, what, what's, it, what's your comment? Well, the comment on that is, uh, uh, I don't think that they should be done routinely. And the evidence for uh, routine administration, there's a, a, a meta-analysis uh, looking at this. Uh, the data is very poor in terms of, of uh, showing any kind of real benefit of uh, doing routine glycerin suppositories or glycerin enemas in our preterm babies. Uh, I think that, uh, uh, if you don't put anything into the gastrointestinal tract, nothing is going to come out. And so I think that one of the biggest, best stimuli for making a baby poop is to put some food into the gastrointestinal tract. That stimulates the motility, it uh, stimulates uh, whatever primitive gastrocolic reflex might be, might be there. Uh, so I think that that's the most important factor uh, to, uh, to to do these procedures, I think it is superfluous. And uh, it, there may be certain babies where it may be helpful, but to do them routinely, we don't have the evidence that, that shows benefit. Dr. Hariram, I can see you. You can, you can unmute yourself. <laughs> you're not, you're not, you're muted. He's waving from his car, but he's muted. We can't hear you at all. Oh, there he is. I think you're still muted, Dr. Hariram. He's technologically challenged. <laughs> Do you want to say something, Dr. Haveron? Uh, I think you're still muted. No, he's gone. All right, okay. We might quickly I move see on him. that. Oh, yeah, I see him. I see him too. Yeah. <laughs> so, hello. Okay. Anyway, we'll see you in Bangalore. So, um, maybe have you got time to run through a couple more comments, uh, Joe? Sure. Sure. Yeah. Um, sure. So Dr. Arjun asks, well, your opinion about the role of domperidone and erythromycin for feed intolerance? Yeah, so uh, domperidone, uh, I, I have never used uh, domperidone. Uh, it uh, is supposed to stimulate motility of the gastrointestinal tract, uh, but similar to, uh, it, it has a slightly different uh, mechanism uh, uh, to uh, compare to cisapride or propulsin, which is a, 
a drug that we used prior to about 10 years ago, and it was being very commonly used here in the, in the U.S., but then it was taken off the market because it uh, caused uh, cardiac uh, dysrhythmias, tersad de point cardiac dys dysrhythmias. And mm -hmm. that's one of the pro problems with uh, dumperidone, dumperidone also, that it can cause uh, prolonged QT. Uh, so I don't use uh, dumperidone. Mm -hmm. uh, I have used uh, erythromycin and uh, I am guided by some of the work that was done by uh, my colleagues, PC Ung and colleagues in Hong Kong, where they have uh, written uh, several papers on the use of erythromycin in preterm babies for feeding tolerance, uh, for feeding intolerance. And the way I generally use erythromycin is uh, on the high dose, I use it enterally, uh, give it for two to three days. And if I don't see a benefit, in terms of feeding tolerance, I stop it. If I do see a benefit, I will stop it in about two weeks because uh, then the baby has probably grown out of uh, the need for uh, uh, erythromycin. Most of the feeding intolerance that we see in our babies is, is developmentally related and uh, the babies will outgrow that and outgrow the need for the uh, erythromycin. I have never seen pyloric stenosis develop with uh, uh, erythromycin treatment, but that is a concern that uh, some people have had uh, with uh, the uh, use of erythromycin. Definitely. But I, o I, 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 I only use it very seldom. Uh, I, I would try other techniques such as prolonging the feeding infusion to an hour or two hours, rather than uh, going straight to uh, the uh, uh, straight to the erythromycin. Right, then you're in continuous feedings, I suppose, as long as there's some food going yes. in. Yes, yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. All right, Mima, I take one last question from Dr. Harian from Brisbane. Elizabeth, I can see you online. Yep, hello. Um, so yeah, we have, <coughs> we've started, can you hear me? I can Very well, yeah. thank you, yeah. Um, so we've stopped doing gastric aspirate some time ago, and we also, uh, before that, introduced a package of very early feeding and very, what, what uh, some people might call aggressive TPM, including starting lipids at two grams per kilo per day on the first day. But um, the question I have is whether we should commence donor milk on day one. Um, what we prefer to do is wait for mum's milk because we worry about the message we're giving if we reach for the donor milk straight away so we try and really push on encouraging mum to keep expressing and reassuring her that her milk will come in um, we don't have any good evidence that it does put mums off but that's what we worry about so I wondered what you're feeling about rushing in with donor on day one versus being patient for mum's rich colostrum yes yeah. so our experience in our uh institution uh we actually uh dr parker uh my co uh, colleague from, from the college of nursing uh wrote a paper on this and showed that when the uh, uh american academy of pediatrics guidelines uh were instituted in our uh center one of the things that happened was that our use of baby's own mother's milk dropped. And what happened, I think, was that the nursing staff, the mothers, you know, people be, did become complacent. So you're absolutely right. That can happen. But there are centers where they uh, really made sure that, that uh, uh, you know, the mothers and the nursing staff were very cognizant of the fact that that the uh, that the donor milk was only a very temporary bridge, and as soon as possible, uh, every you know the, the uh, baby's own mother's milk should be used as soon as possible. So I, I think that part of it is the attitude and the complacency of the uh, the 
uh, individual center. Thank you. One question. Uh, yes, Joe? of course. Um, who's? Oh, it's many. Harry, Harry. Yeah, Sorry. many. Yeah, of course, Dr. Haram. Nice to meet you. <laughs> okay. See, many extremely low birth weight units pass meconium on day five or day seven sometimes. Have you noticed any link between this and feed intolerance or feed tolerance? I think in certain babies that uh, that that there may be a relationship, uh, but it's uh, to 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 put that, that into a, um, a, a, a any kind of a strong strong association. I don't think that we can do that from a statistical standpoint. But I think that there are some individual babies that I'm convinced that uh, uh, some of those babies do have. Uh, uh, like meconium plug or something that uh, that uh, makes them uh, uh, have more difficulty with with central feeding. So uh, I've become maybe a little bit less dogmatic about uh, uh, doing uh, uh, allowing some irrigations or uh, doing gentle uh, uh, rectal swabs or you know doing some things. To uh, to try to pass that baby to, for that baby to try to pass meconium. I have another question. Yeah. Hello. Can you hear me? Oh yes, of yes. course. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, have you noticed any change in the feed uh, tolerance or feed intolerance when you compare uh, human milk based human milk fortifier versus bovine milk based human milk fortifier? We have been using human milk based human milk fortifier in our unit, and we have found good feed tolerance in extremely low birth weight babies. What are your comments? Yeah, I, I think that uh, the uh, head to head study on that is uh, in the process of being done. And so I, I can't tell you what the results of that study, uh, what the results of that study are. Is but uh, I think that uh, probably within the next year we'll have those results. Thanks, Joe. Thank you, Harry. Thank you, Dr. Haram. Okay, I think Thanks. it's uh, Dr. News bedtime now. <laughs> uh, Joe, that was amazing. Thank you. You have challenged a lot of our current practices, and it's a uh, it's food, haha, -ha, joke, <laughs> food for thought. Um, if you're okay with the recording uh, being posted, uh, I think a lot of people are waiting for it. Uh, it'll be appreciated. So uh, for those in the audience, any other questions, either email me or Dr. New directly, I guess. Um, and uh, we'll, uh, he will answer your questions. Is that right, Joe? Yes. <laughs> yes. I will try. Thank you so much. Yes. So um, I can't see you anymore. What happened to you? Um, hang on a minute. Uh, view speaker. Okay, Dr. Hari Ram is still there. <laughs> Dr. Hari Ram. Anyway, um, anyway, thank you everyone for joining. Um, I'll post the recording for the talk uh, in the next few days. And uh, again, thank you. To thanks. Thank Joe. you. Thanks. Thank you, Joe. Good sleep. Bye. Thank you. Good night, Bye. everybody. Bye. Bye. Good afternoon. <laughs> Bye. You. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the RHW Newborn Care Seminars. Um, so our notices about our talks are available on WhatsApp, WeChat, Telegram, and Signal. You can email Julie or myself, and we can add you onto the groups or send you the invites. 
um, some few housekeeping rules. So please ensure you're muted at all times, except of course, to ask a question or comment. You will have 10 to 15 minutes at the end of the talk for Q&A. And please use the reaction button to raise your hand or use the chat box by writing your name in it. So we know you wish to ask a question or type a question in the chat box and we will try to get to as many of them as possible. And the talk, of course, will be available with our speaker's permission on the UNSW website. And over to you, Julie. Thank you very much, Rahul. Uh, it's certainly a pleasure to introduce our speaker today, uh, Dr. Joseph New. I had the amazing um, pleasure and opportunity to meet Dr. New in Bangkok this year, and I was blown away by his um, knowledge and his, um, um, I guess, his uh, interest in NEC and feeding the ba newborn baby. So currently, Dr. New, for those of um, the small part of the world that don't know him, he's professor of neonatology at the University of Florida, and he's got an extremely impressive CV, as well as being the organizer of um, the current Hippocrates sessions. Um, I think the next one's in Bangalore, Joe, right? You want lots of yes. people to go there. November 3rd. <laughs> yes. yes. Fantastic. So since um, today, he'll speak to us on the very complex issue of feeding with very tiny baby who, um, you know, we all know is very challenging. You know, them if you do, them if you don't. And uh, he will go through the underlying physiology and, the, um, you know, I guess the consequences of not feeding these little babies. So without further ado, Joe, because it's very, very late in your time, over to you. Thank you very much. Okay, well, thank you very much, Julia. I am, uh, it's a real honor to be able to, uh, to speak to your group here. Uh, it's uh, close to midnight here in Florida right now. So past my bedtime, but this is, this is fun. We're going to have a little party right now, and uh, we'll talk about the neonatal intestinal tract, use it or lose it. And here we have uh, a baby that many of us are seeing more and more often. This is a 25 week. Uh, your, your, share, your, your slides aren't up yet, Joe. Oh, they're not up? Okay. Yeah, not up yet. Uh, I am seeing them. Uh, Okay, share screen. I will need to pull it up again. Mm -hmm. I lost my... No worries, take your time. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, Can you see it? Uh, not yet. I think I may have lost the Zoom session. Let's. <laughs> okay. Gosh, I had it up before. You you did yes. Uh, can you see the share icon, the share screen? Hold on, I on the bottom. Think I need to. Right at the bottom of your screen, there should be a green share icon. What I can do is I can withdraw, I can make you uh, 
withdraw your permission and then reassign okay. you. Oh, here, hold on. Oh, you got it? Yep. Mm -hmm. It should be there. Okay, share screen. There we go. Yay! Okay. okay. Go, go. Thank you. Okay, so can you see this now? Yep, all good. Thank 25 you. 25-week uh, preterm baby. And the question here is uh, how we go about uh, best nourishing this baby. Well, uh, this is a 25-week gestation preterm, and this baby should still be in the uterus. And when this baby is in the uterus, uh, uh, he or she is getting a continuous supply of glucose. Uh, protein is taken up at around 4 grams per kilogram per day. That fetus is getting lipids at 3 grams per kilogram per day and also receiving 150 milliliters per kilogram per day of amniotic fluid through the gastrointestinal tract. So the gastrointestinal tract is not just resting in this uh, fetus. The gastrointestinal tract is actually being used. Now, in terms of uh, prenatal enteral nutrition, this, uh, uh, we do have swallowing in the fetus, like I just mentioned, and this develops at around 18 to 20 weeks gestational age. And there is some evidence that uh, uh, amniotic fluid does contribute to nutrition of the fetus because it contains about four grams per liter of protein. This is uh, uh, somewhat less than what you find in human milk. It's, uh, human milk is around 10 grams per liter, but it does contribute to some of the uh, nutrition of the uh, fetus. In rabbit models, it's, it's estimated that 10 to 14% of fetal nutrition comes from the amniotic fluid. Now, when a baby is born preterm, the, uh, this preterm baby has a, a decreased amount of gastric acid production, has increased permeability of the uh, 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 gastrointestinal epithelium, has reduced immunoglobulins and immature mucin barrier. So this is a very um, vulnerable intestine, very fragile intestine that is prone to insults for uh, various reasons, including these. And uh, if you'd like to uh, uh, perhaps read uh, more about uh, this, uh, this, this whole issue, we recently published a paper uh, review article uh, that I refer you to, and it's titled Gastrointestinal and Feeding Issues for Infants Less Than 25 Weeks of Gestation. But I'll be talking about uh, some of this as we go through this lecture. So in the past, uh, it's been very uh, common that uh, we use all kinds of excuses to withhold entral feedings in these uh, very fragile preterm babies. Why? Because we're concerned that these babies are not going to be able to tolerate these feedings or that these babies might get what we see on this slide here, a very distended abdomen. And this is uh, what we commonly refer to as necrotizing enterocolitis. And there are all kinds of dogmas uh, around enteral feeding of preterms. And these dogmas state that umbilical catheters should not be, uh, if, if we're using umbilical catheters, we should not be feeding babies. If we've had low APGAR scores, we should not be feeding these babies. If there's apnea, bradycardia, mechanical ventilation, CPAP, they're on vasoactive drugs. If they're on endomethacin, we should not be feeding these babies. These are all dogmas in neonatology but none of these are evidence-based. And I think that's very important to remember. These have uh, uh, just seemed to make sense to people, but the evidence behind these practices is really not there. So where do we go with this? Well, here is on the bottom of this, uh, this slide, Richard Ehrenkrantz. He is a neonatologist at Yale University. And uh, the late 1990s, uh, he looked at the uh, uh, weight gain uh, of a reference fetus that's in utero, and he looked at the 50th percentile of weight gain and the 10th percentile of weight gain. And then he looked at babies who were born and taken care of in the neonatal intensive care unit. Here's 24, 25 week, 26, 27, 26, uh, 28 to 29 weeks gestation. And we can see that uh, the average 
uh, weight of these babies lags behind, well behind that of a reference fetus. So we are actually causing extra uterine growth restriction in these babies. They are not growing anywhere near the same way that they would be growing in the uterus. And this is a potential cause for alarm. Why? Well, here's another slide that I think uh, should be uh, uh, very uh, important to our understanding of the body composition of these extremely low birth weight babies. So here we have 24 week, 26, 26, uh, 28, 40 week gestation babies. And here we see some of their body composition. This 24 week gestation preterm has 1% body fat, 0.1% body fat. That provides about 19.5 calories. The 26 weeker has a little bit more, 1.5% body fat, which can provide 123 calories. But that energy store is really not enough. It would take a very short period of time to utilize all that energy. And this uh, preterm baby, once this energy is utilized, uh, the fat energy is utilized, this baby will begin to undergo catabolism, breaking down the rest of the lean body mass to produce glucose. So this is highly problematic. We know from numerous studies that if a baby is being fed enterally, exclusively by the intestinal route, usually that baby can grow at 100, if that baby is getting 120 calories per kilogram per day. If that baby is on TPN, that means no enteral feeding, one can attain positive nitrogen balance with 60 calories per kilo per day with about 2.5 grams per kilo per day of protein. But if you want that baby to grow on TPN, you have to give that baby approximately 80 calories per kilogram per day. Now, in most of these very low birth weight micro preemies, we cannot get to full enteral feeding quickly. And we have to use intravenous nutrition as a bridge to full enteral feeding. But we can get to enteral feeding much faster than we thought we could in the past. In the past, it was very common to sometimes keep babies NPO for one, two weeks, and even longer. This is no longer uh, our practice, and this is uh, a practice that we are now uh, undergoing based on evidence, which I'll show you. Now, in terms of the energy requirements of this 25 week preterm baby, I said before that baby requires about 120 calories per kilo per day. What does that equate to in terms of an adult? Well, here's an adult who is doing the Tour de France, riding his bicycle all day long. With riding that bicycle all day long, that guy needs 7,000 calories per day. And assuming he's 60 kilograms, he is getting 120 calories per kilo per day. But that is as a Tour de France bicycle rider. So this is telling us that this baby is requiring a tremendous amount of energy. This is not just for metabolic processes, but also for growth. The amount of protein on a per kilogram basis is also huge that this baby requires. Preterm infants require four to five times as much protein per kilogram compared to an adult. So this is telling us that this is required not just for metabolic processes, but also for growth. If you think of how fast a fetus is growing in utero, and how fast a preterm baby should be growing in terms of the growth curves, preterm baby should be doubling or tripling its body weight within the first two to three months after birth. And that is one of the reasons why this baby on a per kilogram basis requires so much energy and so much protein. If the babies do not get this, then this could be problematic. These are graphs showing 
the uh, uh, MDI, Mental Development Index, Physical Development Index, less than 70, cerebral palsy rate, and also neurodevelopmental impairment at different feeding levels in uh, preterm babies. So here we see very low feeding level, here's a high feeding level. And we see that the mental development index is much better for those babies who are getting a higher amount of feeding per day, 21.2 versus 12.0. And neurodevelopmental impairment down here is considerably less in those babies who are being fed higher quantities on a per kilogram basis. Now, I just want to talk a little bit about parenteral nutrition before I get into enteral. And we sometimes are very slow with initiating certain types of parenteral nutrition. For example, it's dogma that we should be providing slow increment, slow incremental increases of lipid to our micropremies. So for example, many neonatal intensive care units you start with 0.5 on the first day, one, and then 1.5 on the third day, then two. They go up very slowly. There is no rationale for that. And numerous studies have shown that we can provide between two to three grams per kilo per day safely to these babies of intravenous lipid if we provide that over a prolonged period of time, over 20 hours in a con slow continuous infusion. We know that essential fatty acid status in early infancy is low. And this is rapidly exacerbated with lipid-free nutrition. And I'll show you a slide on that shortly. And we also know that long chain polyunsaturated fatty acid derivatives from essential fatty acids are important in brain and retinal development. And so these need to be supplied. And we also need to provide energy in the form of lipid to prevent catabolism and to spare protein. So let's just talk a little bit about the essential fatty acids. And what do we mean by essential fatty acids? These are the fatty acids that uh, cannot be produced by the body. They have to be taken in via dietary sources. And these are linoleic and linolenic acid. And you can see there's an omega-2 fatty acid and omega, I'm sorry, an omega-6 fatty acid and omega-3 fatty acid. So the linoleic is an omega-6, linolenic is an omega-3 fatty acid. What does this mean? Well, very simply, we have 18 carbons in both of these uh, uh, long chain fatty acids, these essential fatty acids. We have, uh, a certain number of double bonds, and this is the nomenclature used for our uh, the way that we name these uh, uh, fatty acids. And here is the position of the first double bond from the non-carboxyl, the omega, or the N-terminus. This happens to be oleic acid, which is a monounsaturated fatty acid. By monounsaturated, we mean that there is only one double bond. The omega-6 and the omega-3s have uh, their uh, first double bond at the three position or the six position from the uh, methyl terminus. And that's why they are called omega-3 and omega-6. And these are precursors for very important long chain fatty acids, such as DHA, glucosa, hexaenoic acid, or arachidonic acid. And so the uh, uh, linoleic and linolenic acid get elongated and desaturated to, pro, uh, to produce these uh, longer chain fatty acids. In the preterm baby, these desaturation elongation mechanisms are lacking, and many babies cannot really perform these because of enzy enzymatic immaturities. So we also, in many of these babies, have to give docosahexaenoic and arachidonic acid. Now, Getting back to uh, the amount of lipid that these babies require for growth, before I mentioned that we need 80 calories per kilogram per day if these babies are being only fed by the parenteral route. And here, if we assume that the baby is getting glucose at eight milligrams per kilo per minute, that provides 39 calories. 
amino acids at three grams per kilo per day, that provides 12. And if you do the calculation, you still need approximately or close to three grams, oops, three grams per kilo or three grams per kilo per day of uh, uh, lipid uh, to provide the uh, uh, full 80 calories per kilogram per day. So that has to be supplied if we want to provide for growth in these babies by the parenteral route. Now, here's just a couple important uh, summarizing messages in terms of lipid. The in utero lipid supply is approximately 2.5 to 3 grams per kilo per day. And that's what we should be providing to these babies right after birth. There is no reason why we cannot be doing this right after birth. Essential fatty acid status in early infancy is low and is rapidly exacerbated with lipid-free nutrition. The long-chain polyunsaturated fatty acid derivatives from the essential fatty acids are important in brain and retinal development. And we also have to give these lipids for the prevention of catabolism and protein sparing. So in terms of lipid, what day do you start? How much do you start with? You should be starting at around three grams per kilo per day and providing that uh, uh, over approximately 24 hours a day in terms of uh, uh, the lipid support. What about amino acids and proteins? Well, this is a, a picture of a good friend, Patty Thoreen, who uh, she actually passed away quite a few years ago, had uh, uh, early onset uh, uh, Alzheimer's disease, but uh, uh, she had some fantastic contributions to the field of neonatal nutrition. And this just happens to be one of them, where she did some studies looking at uh, uh, protein balance when babies were getting one gram per kilo per day of amino acid, shown here, versus three grams per kilo per day of amino acid. And these were the, uh, uh, the nitrogen balance measured by two different techniques using nitrogen balance method with isotopes and the other just uh, looking at uh, the amount of uh, nitrogen that came out of the urine and the stools compared to the amount of nitrogen that went in. And you can see that the nitrogen balance with three grams per kilo per day is much better than with only one gram per kilo per day. In fact, you hardly get positive nitrogen balance with one gram per kilo per day. So we need to provide at least three grams per kilo per day. Is this safe? Well, she found that the BUN levels really do not differ if you give three grams per kilo per day versus one gram per kilo per day. And another interesting finding was that uh, uh, the high amino acid intake with three grams per kilo per day versus the low amino acid uh, intake resulted in the same uh, amount of blood glucose but the insulin level with the high amino acid intake was considerably higher, almost twice that of the low amino acid intake, suggesting that you had a stimulation of the insulin secretion by, the, uh, 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 by these amino acids. So how does that work? If we have delayed TPN, hyper, uh, you can get hyperglycemia and hyperkalemia. So the way this works is if you delay TPN, you have low leucine, arginine, and other amino acids. These are known to stimulate insulin, and if they're low, then the insulin level stays low. With a low insulin, you have high glucose, and with high glucose, potassium goes out of the cells. So you end up having hyperkalemia and hyperglycemia in many of these babies who are not getting early amino acid intake. Here we have the same baby, uh, but now 27 weeks gestation and had, baby had APGARs of three and uh, five, has UA and UV catheters in place, is on mechanical ventilation, and is getting prophylactic in emethacin to try to prevent intracranial hemorrhage. So the questions, we have here, can we feed this baby using the GI tract? What are the consequences of not feeding this baby? And how do we enterally feed this baby? Well, over 60 years ago, uh, 
Professor Elsie Widowson in the UK did some studies on the suckled pig, and she found that the suckled pig's duodenum gains 42% of its weight in the first 24 hours after birth. This is what is called the trophic effect of food in the gastrointestinal tract. If you don't put food into the gastrointestinal tract and just provide uh, uh, nutrients intravenously, you have very minimal, if any, uh, trophic effect on gut growth. So this is problematic. Even though you may be nourishing the baby if you're giving TPN, you are not providing a trophic effect on the gastrointestinal tract. There were other studies done in the UK, and this is a study done in the late 1980s by Dr. Alan Lucas and colleagues, colleagues looking at uh, several gut hormones, enteroglucagon, gastrin, GIP, modulin, and neurotensin. And at birth, they saw these levels. At six days, they saw these levels, and these were babies who were not being enterally fed. So that meant that from the time of birth to six days, you saw no difference in these hormonal levels. But if they were fed, and even if they had respiratory distress syndrome, you saw a marked increase in these uh, uh, gastrointestinal hormones. So these are very important hormones, several of which uh, cause uh, uh, gut growth and also improve motility of the gastrointestinal tract. So if you don't put food into the gastrointestinal tract, you don't have the secretion of these very important hormones. Gastrointestinal motility also increases over the gestational period. And here what we see uh, the uh, uh, an immature uh, motility pattern in babies. The green represents uh, immature motility pattern in babies at 24, 27 weeks gestation. 2831, still quite a bit of uh, uh, immature motility pattern. 32 to 35, it begins to improve. 36 to 42, very little of this immature motility pattern. And from the previous slide, we showed that in, uh, introducing enteral feedings is something that uh, actually will improve this motility pattern. What happens to the liver? if you do not provide enteral nutrition. Well, here's a, a, a picture of uh, piglets who were being fed by the enteral route versus the parenteral route over here. And you can see oh, after seven days of being on total parenteral nutrition, no feeding, that's uh, on the right, we see a liver that looks very different than the liver on the left. We see an H&E uh, section, ballooning of the hepatocytes. We see fat staining and glycogen staining in the liver of the uh, 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 piglet that was only given TPN. So only seven days of TPN can actually cause these changes in the liver of these animals. Over the past several decades, we've begun to recognize more and more that we can provide at least small amounts of feeding to uh, preterm babies. And this happens to be a, a, a paper that we wrote in 1992 that